So far we've talked about threats to networks, let's now move on to talk about identifying vulnerabilities and actually then after that we'll talk about some measures to protect networks. Penetration testing is a very important process when you're determining system security. This is simulating attack in order to find weaknesses. So in the testing process you attack your own system to find any weaknesses that exist. And so kind of this whole simulation of an attack is you trying to gain access to resources without actually knowing the normal means of access. So if you have your own username and password and you're trying to bypass it, you obviously won't use your username and password. The whole point is to try and pretend like you're coming from an external source. And there are two types of pen tests. A white box pen test is to simulate an inside attack where the attacker may have some knowledge of a system and may have basic credentials. So you might have like a, a basic username and password and then you have an administrator one or there's some database which you're not meant to access. Normal employees won't be able to access but you have some knowledge of how it works and so you're pretending uh, you, you are an employee of um, the company. Although penetration testing is usually done by an external kind of company that does it for you. Um, we also have a black box pen test which you can guess is simulating an outside attack, so some hacking. So you have no real knowledge of a system and you have no credentials to use. As I say, this is usually done by an external company and this whole service will involve at the end a review them telling you what they found and then if there are any vulnerabilities then countermeasures will be implemented to try and fix uh, these vulnerabilities. Something we need to discuss is ethical hacking and hacking as a term is a little bit difficult to define. I view it as finding and exploiting vulnerabilities in networks usually and there are kind of three types of hackers kind of colloquially labelled in terms of hats <laughs> For whatever reason, um, you have white hat hackers who are ethical hackers, as we'll mention in a second, but then you have grey hat hackers who are kind of bend the rules a little bit but are generally trying to do this for trying to hack for a, a good cause. And then you have the kind of malicious black hack black hat hackers. So kind of three types, and we're looking at the kind of ethical hackers who are doing this in a legal way if it's done to find weaknesses in a testing context, so if you're doing penetration testing for example. So hacking is usually viewed as bad but in this case we're looking at it from a legal perspective. And more specifically, to be ethical, to be a white hat hacker, you need to first of all really have permission. And I guess for grey hat hackers are kind of in between, so maybe they don't have permission, maybe they're kind of assuming that permission will be granted in a, in a future time. Uh, to be ethical you also need to work securely. If you're trying to find vulnerabilities, if you do find a vulnerability, say, like um, uh, accessing a database, you need to make sure that your work is done securely so that the information you're seeing in this testing context isn't actually seen by someone who isn't doing it in a testing context. You also need to, at the end, notify the administrator of any vulnerabilities you've found. You need to tell them of any weaknesses you've found, otherwise it kind of defeats the whole point. So companies will pay to receive information about any vulnerabilities, then much rather it comes from someone who isn't doing it maliciously but is trying to make some money than someone who is going to try and destroy something. So uh, people can make this into a job if they find some errors in the source code, they'll tell the company and get paid potentially. And as I say, this is kind of when it when, you know, this is kind of borderline work. Pen tests are usually done by companies, so this is all pen tests fall under this category and ethical hacking can be a job. Next we have firewalls which monitor network traffic and filter packets based on set rules. So we talked about in the network videos how data is split into individual packets and so a small part of the packet is the data and then collectively it kind of um, forms the total data being sent. Well this is all about filtering these individual packets and this is a pointless image about firewalls. So the idea is they block packets or they can block packets or connections coming from certain regions. So you'll be surprised, I might have said this before, you'll be very surprised about how many connections come from slightly unexpected or dodgy places. You know, I've looked at my own traffic and it'll come from like North Korea, from China, from South America perhaps, and it's a bit, you're not quite sure why. So if you are being very careful, you might want to filter these packets out so they can't come through to your network. And uh, perhaps a misconception is that firewall is just some software. It can be software, or it can actually be a dedicated hardware device, or embedded in routers. So your router will have a firewall probably in it, and you can also have a firewall on your computer, you know, managed by your operating system, or you can have just a dedicated firewall, maybe for a, a business. So here is the model of a packet we talked about. 
but we've got our actual data that comprises the, a small part of the total overall data. We've then got a header and a, a trailer. So the header is the most important in terms of between the header and trailer. The header contains information about the IP addresses and the MAC addresses. And so there are two kind of ways to there are two kind of ways a firewall will work, or two generations of firewall, I should say. So the first one filters packets just by looking at IP addresses. So it, it will have a list in it of allowed IP addresses or allowed regions, and it will compare it to the IP addresses in the header. A second generation of firewall is called stateful inspection, and this is a much more clever way of going about it. This is where they look at the context of the data. So they might go so packets are obviously sent in a sequence because the whole idea is they build up to this total data and if one packet is out of place or one packet is suspicious or doesn't make sense then it will use that and maybe filter it based on that and these are two generations modern firewalls will do loads of different methods including these two perhaps but it's more complicated than these two but these are just two ways the firewalls can work another kind of list slide I'm afraid and we need to talk about some more security measures. So first of all, you can get commercial analysis tools, software packages basically, and you can get some free ones as well, uh, designed to find vulnerabilities in your network. And difficult to know what to talk about for this point really, but some types of these are sniffers, which sniff packets are like, in, uh, like eavesdroppers. They can allow you to see packets going through your network. There are programs that will generate malicious code for you, script generators to test your servers, to, check, to test your hardware to see where it's vulnerable. You'd obviously much rather do this yourself in a testing environment than allow someone to do it for real. So this is kind of preempting a potential attack and seeing where the vulnerabilities are yourself. And also just um, tools that allow you to monitor and store packets moving through your network. A measure examiners love is to talk about policies, which are organizational rules an administrator will kind of set for both the network and anyone using the network. So let's go through a few, there's quite a lot of these, but we'll only go through the ones most pertinent to security. So the acceptable use policy is kind of like the terms and conditions you sign when you join a network. So you agree to some rules before actually it allows you to use the network. So when you would have first joined your school, probably you had to do this. When you go to an airport, when you go to a hotel and use their Wi-Fi, often you'll have to agree to terms and conditions. Uh, these will contain loads of stuff, but may contain some stuff about security, maybe some tips if you actually bother to read it, I don't know. But you could mention that in an exam question. And more relevant one is perhaps disaster recovery. This is kind of a contingency plan for when something goes wrong and any corrective measures to kind of make it better or to stop it getting worse perhaps. So this might say if one of the computers in the network has been infected by some malware which is going to spread, disconnect it from the network, turn all the other computers off to stop them getting affected too. Just isolate the incident, don't let it spread. Um, and this is a very common disaster recovery policy. In more serious cases, say if a whole network had to be reset, you would probably restore from a backup if you had a backup policy in place. And you may evaluate this to say actually having a backup data is really good in this context, but this kind of allows, it's another target essentially, isn't it? Because you've got a backup of data, you've got two data sources that could be potentially attacked. So you've got to be very careful with your backup, you've got to make sure it's encrypted and so on. Um, and finally we have a failover policy and this is maybe the most relevant to security. This is where if a piece of hardware fails it's about having essentially a backup hardware uh, device to take over so there's no downtime. We mentioned how a firewall can be an actual physical device maybe in a router. If one of those goes down you're prone to all the air, all the packets it would have filtered out before so you're kind of immediately out in the open. So having a backup device to take over immediately is clearly very important in that case. And this is obviously quite expensive but means that you're not um, prone to any security issues while the main device is down.